there are 3 billion working people in the world, 40% of those people are happy. 60% of those people, they're not happy. We're going to talk to you a little bit about something that we think could make a profound difference to 1.8 billion people in the world. So, imposter syndrome. What is it? It's an internal feeling of phoniness. People feel like frauds. They don't feel that they are qualified for their jobs. They feel uncomfortable and they feel miserable. So it's not a nice feeling. Um, people feel like it's a matter of time before they are found out. So you live with this constant feeling of fear. Has anybody here ever felt like that? Can I have a show of hands? Wow, okay, thank you very much. So who does imposter syndrome affect? Well, it affects up to 70% of us at some point in our careers. So it doesn't differentiate between people with uh, very little experience right at the beginning of their careers or people might have been working for, for 10, 20 years, they can still get imposter syndrome. Um, so that some really famous people have had it. So Tom Hanks, for example, despite winning two Oscars, uh, still feels that he's, he's been lucky throughout his career. Uh, Michelle Pfeiffer. Um, but the one that really stood out when we were doing the research was uh, Einstein. So if he can suffer from it, then I think we, <laughs> we're perfectly within our rights to suffer from it too. Um, there are some factors that make it more likely uh, to suffer with imposter syndrome. Uh, so for example, if you're the first or in a minority, uh, so for example, if you're um, the first in the family to go to university, or uh, if you're the first female engineering manager in infrastructure, um, they can both have an impact. Uh, if you work in a creative industry, so quite often if you're in a creative industry, then uh, that can mean that your work is subjective, um, which can leave uh, room for self-doubt. Also, if you work alone, you don't have positive feedback. Um, so you, you don't have colleagues to, to sort of reinforce that you're on the right track or you don't have a manager to, to give you feedback on the work that you've done. Again, that can lead to, to self-doubt. Um, if you've got highly achieving parents, so quite often that can lead to the belief that you're not living up to an expectation. It's usually an incorrect belief, but still that, that can contribute. Um, if you've achieved success easily or early, Ed, this might ring a bell for you. <laughs> so again, that, that can make you think that you've uh, maybe just been in the right place at the right time, or um, you've, you've been lucky to get the success that you've had. So that doesn't leave many people. In fact, it leaves children of modestly achieving parents who aren't part of a minority who go to a non-creative career where everyone is similar <laughs> to themselves and you work hard, but not too hard to achieve gradual and modest success. So not many people but I probably fit into that category. <laughs> and I've suffered with imposter syndrome. So why is that? Well, first of all, uh, Einstein suffered from it, so I definitely can. Uh, and second of all, we work in tech, not most of the people in this room work in technology. So uh, there's a few factors that we're gonna talk a bit more about later uh, that make it more likely to suffer from imposter syndrome if you work in technology. Okay, so how does it affect people? It affects different people in different ways because everybody is different. But it's not a good feeling. It can lead to anxiety, it can lead to low self-worth, and at its worst, it can lead to depression. Some of the symptoms of imposter syndrome are taking feedback negatively, even when the purpose of that feedback is supposed to be constructive. It can also lead to people becoming perfectionists, so seeking flawlessness, which is wearing, if anybody in this room's ever felt it. There's a story, actually, a TED talk that, um, that I found that really rang true with this. It was um, a story of a lady who um, had distributed a typed memo around her company, and she'd driven home, and she'd gone into, got into bed, and she was mulling over that day's work and she realized in her mind that there was a typo in this memo. So feeling like an imposter and feeling like she needed to achieve that flawlessness, 
She actually got up out of bed, drove back into work, retyped the memo, and redistributed it around the company. Now, that's not only bad for your sleep pattern, but also living with that can be quite difficult. It can also affect you at work. I like this diagram because essentially it shows that imposter syndrome affects you and there's a, a cycle of the three Ps. Perfectionism, where you're driven by fear. Procrastination, where you are crippled by fear. And then paralysis. And this is a really interesting one because this is where people play it safe. They don't volunteer for that task or activity because they feel trapped. They feel like the imposter. They don't feel that they can grab that opportunity. They undermine their own work. This is something that we see quite a lot of in tech, especially people who don't have what I suppose you could call a technology background. So people will start a sentence with, I'm not a techie, but... I would challenge this room, especially those people who don't have that te technology background, to think about when does somebody become a techie? And if you know your subject and you have experience of it, maybe think about how you'd start that sentence because you are worthy of it and your knowledge is valuable. So we talked a bit about uh, there's some factors in technology that make it worse than uh, some other industries. Um, so first of all, 58% of tech employees feel like frauds. So we said 70% of people will be affected at some point in their careers. But at any given point in time, 58% of people in tech will feel that they have imposter syndrome. So that's probably the majority of people in this room feel like this right now. Um, so the question is, why, why is it so bad in technology? Um, and I think the main reason is that there is just so much to it. It's such a broad subject and it is impossible to know all of it. So just to illustrate this, some of these logos that are appearing on the screen are for technologies that are used day to day just by R2 squads, by the DBA squad and by delivery engineering. Um, now we've got people that are experts in maybe one or two of these things, but you know, nobody could honestly say that they're an expert in all of these, all of these different technologies. Uh, if you are, by the way, then just come and see me afterwards and <laughs> we'll sort out a job. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I was umming and ahhing about putting this slide in because Henry Ford was a, a pretty awful human being, but he did come up with a really good quote, uh, which is, none of our men are experts. Uh, we have unfortunately found it necessary to get rid of a man as soon as he thinks himself an expert, because no one ever considers himself an expert if he really knows his job. So this fits in really well with technology, I think. I think if somebody says that they are an expert in all of technology, they probably just don't know technology well enough. I didn't know what to call this slide. <laughs> this, is, this is the story of my, uh, my experience with imposter syndrome. Um, so I started uh, a, a very small company, uh, I think I was employee number seven, uh, straight out of university. Uh, I was a sysadmin and at that point I thought I did know all of technology. So obviously I didn't know the subject well enough. Uh, I thought all there was to technology was Windows NT4, which gives a bit of an indication of how long ago it was. Um, <clears throat> but yeah. It, I kind of worked hard, I, I worked for three years, got a bit of experience, and then it was time to move onwards and upwards. And I got a job at Learn Direct um, in Sheffield, which was going from a company of about 20 people to one with, I don't know, over 200 at the time. And the first thing that I realised when I got there is that's me going from a big fish in a small bowl to a little fish in a big bowl. That's the fish bit. Um, the first thing I realised was everybody knows more than I do. Uh, I was I kind of realised that I didn't know the subject as well as I thought I did. Um, and yeah, I, you know, there's all these people with more experience and more knowledge than me. Um, but again, I worked, I worked hard, I started learning from all these people, I used it to my advantage. Um, but I was there for a long time, I was there for about nine and a half years. And towards the end of that time, um, I, I think I, I stopped sort of pushing myself, stopped learning, stopped trying to work outside my comfort zone. Uh, and I think this can be people's default behaviour. If, if you don't consciously try and push yourself outside your comfort zone, then it is really easy just to stick to what you know. Uh, so in the textbooks they call this a fixed mindset, and you know it's. I think it is. It, it can be unless you have the you know real drive to 
consciously move forward and try and learn new things, then people can default to this behaviour, especially if you're an organisation for a long time, which is what, I, what happened to me. I was there for nine and a half years, but then I got a job at Skybet. Um, now, because I've been sticking inside my comfort zone for so long, I was quite ill-equipped uh, when I came to Skybet. It's a completely new company. Again, I thought, wow, everybody knows more than I do. Um, and for the first six months, to be honest, it was, it was quite uncomfortable. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy getting up in the morning and coming to work. Um, and then after six months, something changed. I was given a new project to manage, which was the Grand National. That's the horses bit. Um, now, if anybody's been involved in the Grand National, some, some people in this room will have done it. Sky is a big deal. And to be honest, I hadn't been involved at this point. I didn't know how much of a big deal it was. If I had, I probably would have done a runner. But what I found was that when I started um, getting involved in the project, I had to speak to different departments, I had to find out what the marketing plans were, how people were going to optimise the database and scale the web tier. And I found that working outside my comfort zone really started to build my confidence. It was, you know, it was a huge help for me. And then at that point onwards, I found that I got more and more confidence just because I was working outside my comfort zone. Um, now, this is some sh something that I do consciously from now on. It's the reason why I'm stood here now instead of in the audience. Um, I kind of actively try and push myself to learn new things all the time because if you don't, especially in technology, you know, you can just stand still and then you're more susceptible to some of the feelings of imposter syndrome. Um, now, I thought it was just me. I didn't know this thing had a name at the time, um, but I became an engineering manager in infrastructure and then one of my reports came to me in a one-to-one -one saying that she felt exactly the same way. So, Lucy, if anybody has, if anybody knows Lucy, then you'll know that she's absolutely awesome. She knows absolutely loads of stuff. Uh, she works really hard, she's really helpful. Um, but yeah, in a one-to-one, -one, she came to me saying that she ex had exactly the same feelings of imposter syndrome. Now, she's probably the last person you'd expect to feel like that. But anyway, when I, I realised I was doing this talk, I went and sat down with Lucy and uh, she came up with some really good quotes that describe how she feels. So the first one, not knowing the answer to everything immediately is worrying. So she's in a bit of a vicious circle in that if somebody asks her a question and she knows the answer, she will not give herself any credit. She'll think, well, obviously I know the answer to that. It's my, you know, it's what I do. But obviously I know the answer. Um, if she doesn't, She'll go away really quickly and give you the answer in loads of detail, but she will beat herself up over it. So whether she knows the answer or not, you know, there's no scope in there to give herself any credit, either for finding it out or for knowing it in the first place. Every time she gets a ticket, uh, whether it's a monkey bot ticket or a BAU ticket or she gets a call out, she will always think, well, this is the one that's going to get me found out. Um, now, rationally, she knows that that's not likely. She's worked here for sort of three years now. She's done hundreds of tickets, but every time, especially for call-outs, every time she sees pager duty on the phone, she thinks, well, I'm not going to be able to fix that. This is, I'm going to get found out now, um, and they'll get rid of me. So there is a rational part of her brain that knows that this can't, this can't be the case. Um, you can't be that lucky for that long, uh, but it's still, you know, it's the feeling that she has. Um, when she does solve something, she thinks, it's only because I've been lucky. 50 things have aligned just to make me be able to solve that ticket. Now again, this is really unlikely if you work in IT for long enough, if you do enough tickets, then you know you can't be lucky every time. So the rational part of her brain thinks, okay, this is just the symptoms of imposter syndrome. Uh, so again, in, in the same way that I was forced to do the, the Grand National and I was forced outside my comfort zone, Lucy makes a conscious effort to try and sort of counter these by constantly moving outside her, her comfort zone. She'll always put her hand up to do uh, workshops for the squad, so she does that around the company. Uh, she does tech talks uh, after work, um, she's just submitted a talk to Hashi Days in Amsterdam. So she knows that this is a problem and she knows that the only way to fix it is by continuing to try and learn and push yourself. Okay. Right, so I'm going to take you back to June 2018. And I was standing outside of a, some lifts. And they got a call, and it was from a recruitment manager at Skybet and Gaming. <coughs> and they said, you've got the job. And I was so excited. This job for me represented a real opportunity to step out of what I've been doing and into technology and into this company. Now, that 
feeling only lasted for about 20 seconds. And then the little voice in my head started to say, you're not good enough. When you start that job, they'll find you out. They'll know. You won't be able to manage a team. They've made a mistake. And I lived with that little voice for my three month build up to joining um, Skybet and Gaming. And it didn't stop when I walked through the doors. I started to hide behind my coffee cup in the morning. I didn't say hello to people. I thought, maybe if I'm quiet, maybe I won't be found out, which doesn't really work when you've got a team to work with because you can't hide behind anything when you've got a great group of people that are looking to you to actually, well, work with them. So it got quite bad. It, it, it got to the stage where I was genuinely not enjoying going into work. I must have talked about it at home and at work. And I felt embarrassed. I actually avoided Will for the first two months of my job because he hired me. So I thought, oh my gosh, right, so if I hide, he won't know that he's hired this person who doesn't have any technology experience. So we have EM meetings and I would sit as far away from him as possible. Um, obviously that's changed because we're working together on this. But yeah, it was pretty bad. Um, so what did I do? I'm a fairly determined person. Um, I had surgery about two years ago and I'm really squeamish. So I kind of draw on that experience when I'm going through something tough. And the little voice in my head that was telling me, you can't do this, you're not good enough, started to be talked to by another little voice. And this little voice started to tell me, no, you can do this. You don't have to know everything. You can start to learn. You got this. And the more that I kept stepping through the doors in the morning and moving slightly away from my coffee cup and whispering hello to a few people, the more that the voice kept saying, actually, you're okay. You're gonna, it's gonna be okay. You can learn about databases. You can learn about technology. And actually, you're gonna ace it. So it's been quite a difficult journey. And I'm not saying that I'm at the end of that. I agree with what Will said about challenging yourself but also recognizing that imposter syndrome is very hard to deal with and it can be quite miserable. So that leads me on to as a manager. So I have a wonderful squad of seven really brilliant engineers and we run the databases um, for this company. And I thought they're so confident, they're managing this system and they, there's no way that anybody in my squad is going to feel like they're an imposter. And when I said to them that I was going to be doing this talk, people started talking about imposter syndrome in one-to-ones. And I absolutely kicked myself. I thought, why have I not brought this up earlier? How have I been doing this job and not introduced this subject with my team? Because it's been causing them misery. And it was really interesting that the, you know, the people in my team who are absolutely brilliant you know they're, they're, they're working really really hard and they're doing the best that they can are feeling like this and I reflected I reflected on the way that I I work with people and I thought well maybe as a manager honesty and radical candor when you're managing people is really really important so giving feedback so it's definitely something that I'm still working on um, Okay, so what can you do? So the good news is, everybody, it's not up to your manager um, or to people other than yourselves to be able to do something about it. You can do something about it yourself. One of the ways that um, people talk about dealing with imposter syndrome is to practice meditation. I was incredibly dubious about this, but there are some really great apps, some really great books, and meditation is scientifically proven to reduce the flight or fight part of your brain. So it actually calms you down and helps you deal with that anxiety. You can also practice your growth mindset. So this is another thing that Will touched on. So changing the voice from I can't do something to I can, I can do it. I've recently taken up playing the guitar. 
I'm terrible. Um, I can probably play about two notes, um, but I'm aiming for Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, and who knows, Leeds Fest in the future. But I used to say to myself, I can't play the guitar, I'm not musical, there's no way. And I thought, Rachel, you're going to have to practice what you preach. So I started to sell myself I could. Um, and what else can you do? Well, in technology specifically, you don't have to know everything all the time. It's okay to say to somebody, I don't know the answer to your question right now, but I'll go away and find out. That's so much better than giving the wrong information. We are so lucky here that we have so many wonderful people who actually will go out of their way to help you out. When I started at Skybet, um, my uh, peers actually took time to explain to me how our technology works and interacts. And I really don't feel ever as if I don't have somebody to ask questions. If you don't have somebody in your working environment or some buddies in your working environment that you can reach out to, find a mentor. I, I have an amazing mentor. I've had several amazing mentors. And they're just people who I've thought, oh, I like what you're doing. The way that you work is really awesome. Can we go for a coffee? And most of the time, people will say, yeah, sure, that's awesome. I'll, I'll talk to you. And we have a great chat. Um, and finally, um, if it gets really bad and those feelings of feeling like an imposter get to the stage where you just don't know how to manage them, there is other help that people can get, like counselling. And sometimes that's really, really important. And I felt that was valuable to talk about here because um, it's sometimes a little bit taboo to go out and get that help. So those are the things you can do as an individual, but those of you who, who manage people that might have imposter syndrome, there's also things that, that you can do as well. So the first thing, everybody has this responsibility, um, it needs to be an inclusive working environment. Everybody needs to feel that they can come to work and they can, they can be themselves. Um, it's, it's, this is probably the, the most important thing out of all these points. Give opportunities to learn, grow and fail. So at Skybet we've got L&D time, people are encouraged um, if, they, if they feel that there's one area of their knowledge that, that you can do with um, sort of expanding on then Friday afternoons at L&D time. So it's a really useful tool to, to help people sort of counter those uh, feelings of imposter syndrome. Um, fail, I'm not telling people that they should try things on production kit and break stuff. Um, it needs to be in a controlled environment, but at the same time it needs to be uh, a, like a no-blame culture. If people do break things, then we, we can't go blaming them because then they'll just stop going outside their comfort zone, they won't try things again, and then you know, it'll just make these feelings even worse. Um, suitable organisational structure. So um, most companies have small squads and those squads have a very distinct business area. Uh, it's really important that there's no sort of gaps in knowledge. People aren't being expected to do things or uh, that they're not comfortable with. Um, they need to have a really clear uh, set of responsibilities within their organisational structure. Coaching and mentoring, so this kind of goes with the last one, which is listen, observe, feedback and repeat. So as a manager, this is really just about being available. So Rachel talked about accepting feedback as an individual, but also as a manager, it's really important to give constructive feedback to the people that report to you. Um, and above anything else, just, just be honest. You need to be honest with, with your staff and then hopefully we'll all end up as happy as this guy here. <laughs> Right, so this is my favorite quote. So I'm going to read it to you, which is, I suppose, not what you're supposed to do when you do a presentation. But essentially, our message, if you take nothing else from our talk today, is just keep on keeping on. Um, you're here for a reason. In this job, in your business, in life, you are worthy. You're better than you think you are. You are smarter than you think you are. You know more than you give yourself credit for. Remember that, remind yourself as often as you need to, and if you'd like to, please get in contact. We're both on LinkedIn, we're actually not too scary, um, so yeah, if you want to drop us a line and share any stories, please do. Any questions? No, move on. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any questions? No, there, there is... Um, 
if people do are interested in the in the subject, these are the books that we use to research this talk. So. Yeah. I haven't, and I hope that I don't, but Will, have you...? I, I haven't experienced that. Um, I think in most cases it can be managed. Um, as a manager, it is really important to try and spot those, you know, to have those conversations really often and to try and spot those symptoms, uh, because, you know, generally speaking, it can be managed just by, you know, giving people the chance to learn and, um, you know, those things that we talked about, you can usually kind of spot it and, and deal with it in that way. I think the other really important thing is that we're all incredibly busy um, in our jobs, but making time for your team and having your one-to-ones with them, even when you've got mm, pressing deadlines, your time with your team is the most important thing. One of my mentors once told me that, and it's just affected everything I do. That is the most important thing in my day is my team. Everything else, it's important, but if they're okay and they're feeling that they've got my ear and we're working together, that is a really profound success, I think. Hi. So we get this one quite often in uh, software development. Um, so generally people's uh, natural instinct is to code something to absolute perfection so they you know, it couldn't be better. Whereas the kind of methodology that, that we follow as a company is to try and get things out as fast as possible, minimal, minimum viable product, get it in front of the customers. So the only thing that I found that works with that particular uh, use case is that you've just got to reinforce the fact. You've, it might not come naturally to them, but over, over time if you keep sort of reinforcing it, you know, every time you have a planning meeting or if you spot somebody taking longer on a ticket because they're trying to make it absolutely perfect, then it, it's just reinforcing that message, I think. Yeah, yeah. And from a coaching perspective, I, I try to find out where the fear is coming from and work on that and really work with that person to try and understand the basis of it. Because yes, it might be a symptom as perfectionism. You might be linking it to imposter syndrome, but really trying to understand why that person is feeling like that is helpful. Hello. You mentioned about you, you, you mentioned that you were doing this talk to your team. Um, how did you get them to, to, to say, oh yeah, I think I should ask them about it? Did they what you say? So I didn't, I, um, I didn't ask them about it specifically to start with, which is probably my reflection on this, actually starting to lead those conversations. Um, I just happened to mention I was doing this talk and that they were under no obligation to, to actually be here, but a couple of them are, uh, which is great, and I'm very flattered. Um, but yeah, so I, I think as a manager, I've definitely learned from that, and next time, and from going forward, I'll definitely talk about imposter syndrome and introduce it as a conversation topic with my team. So, thank you. Hello. How would you think the identification step that you're being affected by this is part of the solution to the problem? As in identifying imposter syndrome? Yeah, identifying that's how you for yourself if you've got this problem. Could you not have asked an easy one? <laughs> um, I don't know, I think even if you don't ide identify it as imposter syndrome, I think the steps that you take uh, to, to manage it will probably be, be the same, even if you don't give it the name imposter syndrome, if you don't identify it like that. So obviously learning and giving positive reinforcement, all of those are kind of good practice anyway, whether, whether yeah. you think somebody's got imposter syndrome or not, it's kind of good practice. I think we don't always have to have gone through something to actually be able to work with somebody else on it some level of understanding and actually thinking well this might be what's going on can be quite valuable um, and it may not be imposter syndrome it may be something else um, yeah that would be my answer <laughs>